Uh, and uh, now, dear colleagues, um, uh, let's start our scientific session and uh, let's discuss um, our topics and uh, the dilemmas in glaucoma. And first of all, the dilemmas in glaucoma diagnostics, uh, tonometry, uh, why is it required? And I would like to invite uh, for the first presentation Dr. Mansouri, uh, Ko Mansouri, the Associate Professor of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, Denver, USA, and Consultant Ophthalmologist of the Montchoisy Clinic in Lausanne, Switzerland. His uh, topic is continuous IOP measurement is more important than single tonometry. Welcome. Большое спасибо, доктор Курушева. Большое спасибо, профессор Петров, профессор Трубилин. Я надеюсь, что вы меня хорошо видите и слышите. Ну что ж, я вижу сейчас свою презентацию здесь. Я хотел бы тогда попросить вас перейти на следующий слайд. Это раскрытие конфликта интересов. Я непосредственно занимаюсь вопросами мониторинга внутри глазного главления. Что касается непосредственно глукомы, все сводится к внутриглазному давлению, но также внутри черепное давление, профессиональное давление тоже играет очень важную роль. И, конечно, что касается этих аспектов, они должны приниматься во внимание при ведении пациентов с глаукомой. Что касается непосредственно старых стандартов, непосредственно, то мы видим, что тонометрия имеет очень много недостатков. Таким образом, мы видим, что главное ограничение заключается в том, что планационная тонометрия по Гольдману дает нам возможность измерять давление в течение двух секунд в день. Она варьируется от секунды к секунде, от минуты к минуте на основе имеющихся факторов, которые вы видите. Стресс играет роль, body position plays a role, and many other factors influence IUP. Even this talk, as you are listening to it, may influence your IUP in one way or another. So, as an Not as a surprise, we miss peak IUP, which um, Professor Susanna will speak about is, we believe, related to IUP, uh, sorry, to glaucoma progression. We miss the highest IUP in over two thirds of our glaucoma patients. And probably as a direct consequence, axonal injury in glaucoma occurs at IUP levels, which we consider to be normal or physiological. Now, next slide. If you see these beautiful flamingos from the San Diego Zoo, This was from my fellowship over 20 years ago there. The difference is we humans, when we go from the wake position to the sleeping position, this is the next slide, we change our body position. Flamencos don't. We go into the supine lying body position. And IUP increases at night time. Next slide. Here you see from 20 years of work at the San Diego Sleep Laboratory that IUP in most patients and in most healthy subjects is highest while we sleep at night time. This is when we ophthalmologists do not obtain IUP measurements. Why is that so? Well, this slide from Arthur Seed from a study conducted at Mayo Clinic showed precisely why this happens. Because while your IUP flow production decreases by 50% at night time. This is the second column. It goes from 2.5 a day to 1.3 at night. Facility, the classical um, facility doesn't really change at night time. Um, episcopal venous pressure doesn't change at night time. It's around 7.4 day at night. But what Arthur Sita and his colleagues say is that the uvuscular outflow really is almost inexistent at night time. And this is probably the main reason why IUP is higher while you sleep at night. However, our patients, and this is the next slide, are not averages. Patients behave differently. Next slide, please. And it's important to know our individual patient's IUP rhythm over 24 hours. Next slide. This is why having measures to measure IUP around the clock either through a contact lens or um, through implantable devices are so important. 
Next slide. I'm not sure my slides are being changed because I don't see them here on the screen. I think you're still stuck a few slides back. Can somebody please go to the next slides? I hope detecting your support is there, not sleeping during my presentation. <laughs> next slide. Continue, please. Next slide. And next slide. Yes, one more. Very good. So you all heard, have heard about the trigger fish contact lens and some colleagues in, in Russia have experience with it. This was a contact lens which we developed in Switzerland about 15 years ago, almost. A soft silicone contact lens that has strain gauges which measure changes of the ocular circumference. And these changes are related to IOP changes, to volume changes of the eye, and reflect also the biomechanical properties of the eye. Initially, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Even the economists spoke about this device because we really believed we had a device, easy to use device, which would measure IOP around the clock. In bench testing, the laboratory, this was the case. The measurements were really one-to-one -one comparable to manometry. However, we needed to get more data, of course, and the data was forthcoming. We could show that the device is safe, it's reproducible, but the problem was that the measurements are presented in millivolt equivalents. So if you look at this slide, the y-axis doesn't give you millimeter mercury changes, but those arbitrary units. However, the measurements, and this is a 24-hour measurement, are useful in the sense that they show you how unstable IUP can be throughout the day in a single patient's eye, and when the highest values occur, usually at nighttime, as you can see here. However, we could not really translate that into, into um, millimeter mercury equivalents. That's why, next slide. Two more slides. Yeah, one more slide, please. That's why having implantable sensors that measure absolute IUP would be very helpful. And another startup, this time a German startup called Implant Data, developed several years ago this round-shaped sensor that can be implanted during cataract surgery into the ciliary sulcus. It has pressure sensors which measure IUP changes. You use a handheld external device to power the sensor and receive the data in return. And here's an example of a patient's IUP measurements performed round the clock by the patient at home for 950 days in a row. This slide essentially answers um, the, the, my, the topic that was given to me. Why is continuous IP measurement more important than single tonometry? Look here at this slide, look at any given day from this slide, and you will see that IUP varies from anywhere between, next slide, sorry, next slide. Here. If you look at this slide, you see that IUP varies from, from anywhere between 5 to 25 on any given day. And you see how in a supposedly well-controlled glaucoma patient, how unstable IUP is on every day. Next slide. Now, the measurements were compared to GAT using different statistical methods. As you can see here, the concordance to GAT was pretty good between 0.7 and 0.8. And you could argue, next slide, that Goldman may not be better because it doesn't really measure in the eye, but through the cornea. So is it the right comparator? We don't know. However, this is what we need to use for regulatory purposes. Next slide. So we had 22 eyes that had this sensor in the eye. We looked at several years of data and we had a total of 106,000 IUP readings, which corresponded to an average of 4,800 a patient over a total of 15,800 measurement days an average of 718 per patient. So this is yeah. far the biggest collection of IUP data of all times in glaucoma. And we were looking if there are weekly variations. We did not find any. Average mean IUP and average peak IUP were pretty similar from one day to another. I should say though that these patients were all retired and didn't have a work weekend um, rhythm. Then we were interested to see if year, months of the year, seasons, affected IUP in the same cohort of patients. And here we found a statistically significant difference. As you can see, the lowest IUPs on average were measured during summer and the highest during winter. And the difference was statistically significant and corresponded to about a 7% difference between summer and 
winter. And this is not insignificant and it can have actual consequences for individual patients as well as for clinical trials of medications. Now, the first sensor is used during cataract surgery. We developed another one to use during glaucoma filtering surgery and place it in the suprachoidal space. The device functions in a similar manner. It is rectangular. You see this, the dimensions on the next slide. Next slide, please. And can you click on it to show you to show the video? Um, well, there's a surgical video here, but since I cannot manipulate it, um, I think it's, I'm sorry, I think it's better could, to go to the next. Can you jump to, towards the end of the video? This is, we start a regular deep screctomy, five by five, we dissect the supervicious cloud flap. We, sorry, we open the supervicious cloud flap, we dissect the deep scroll flap, and then we create a, a pocket into a supercorrigal space where we place this device. I think the video is not running well. Okay, next slide, please. I'm sorry, I have to jump through the video. Okay, this is the patient's eye on the following day. It looks like any normal deep screctomy. Next slide. Here you see the device embedded um, within the surgical site. These are anterior and swept source OCD images. Next slide. And the patient now is happy, returns home. Next slide. And here you see the patient's home IUP measurements with the device on the first post-operative days after his uh, surgery. And this is really something fantastic. You can see from your office um, the patient's data that are transmitted to you through the cloud. We compare the data over a long period of up to a year in all 22, 24 eyes. And you see that the correlation to GAT is very good and varies from day to day, but essentially um, is between plus and minus five meter mercuries in, 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 in up to 100% of measurements. Next slide. What about safety? Of course, safety is an important question, especially with a device that is relatively bulky and that you place in this part of the eye. We were happy to see that there were no serious adverse events. We had one case of corneal detachment, which we solved under medical treatment, and all the other side effects were similar to uh, our regular surgery. Next slide. So to conclude my talk, what can we do today? Of course, you can do a dynotension tension curve. The patient comes several times a day to your clinic. You measure IUP with CAT. It's time, space intensive. You still don't obtain a lot of data. You don't have any next, you don't have any clinical activity data of the patient. Next slide. And you don't get any nocturnal data. And although the patient may look happy when you see on the beginning of the me measurement, he will tire throughout the day. Next slide. So what else can you do? You can use the eye care home tonometer device to give it to the patient for a day or several days. That's sometimes what we do here in Lausanne and the patient measures at home. Um, it has advantages. It's uh, um, relatively cheap. It's, uh, um, so you can rent it out to patients. However, some patients will not be able to obtain measurements because of arthritis or other problems. And the measurements are not always very reliable. And more importantly, you do not obtain sleep data. Next slide. You can use the contact, sense, contact lens sensor, but it's expensive. And the IUP data are not in meter mercuries. And you still get only one single session of a patient. Next slide. So the next step would be, next slide, please. The sensors, which I mentioned, next slide. And here you have the limitations of surgery, lack of long-term safety data so far, and the difficulty to interpret all the data. Next slide. However, I hope I show you the importance of obtaining more than a single GAT measurement that we have devices now that can help us obtain long-term data and they will hopefully improve management, quality of life, and importantly, adherence to medication because now the patients are able to obtain IUP measurements themselves. Next slide. Some challenges remain, as I mentioned, but I hope we can address those in the coming few years. Thank you very much.